So a couple of years ago we did a shop tour. There have not been a great deal of changes made in here yet, but I think we may be on the cusp of making a few changes. So let me show you a little bit of what we've been up to. But note, this has pretty much been a base of operations while we've been building a house, so it's pretty rough shape in here. So if you've got a hard hat and steel toes and you've had all your shots, come on, I'll show you what's going on. So here's a couple of nice additions, three actually. My friend Adrian Lachlan came up with these two old office chairs. I don't know if these are 40 years old or 60 years old or what, but they're the nicest seats in the house. And I put a different wood stove in, what, a year ago last fall or something. And it's more user friendly and the heat comes out better and I like it. We burned quite a bit of wood last winter and had a lot of nice lunches sitting right here in front of this wood stove. I did some file work on some swords and, you know, the buoy knives and stuff. This is a kind of a nice little workstation in the winter. So the stove is good. The chairs are good. So you recognize this probably. This is the standard sort of vlogging and mail room and general Blarney location. This is a Live Edge black walnut slab that I got from Eric Gerritsen. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Eric. And this is a place that clutter heaps up. Clutter and out of control storage is kind of a recurring theme around here. I don't know how it works in your shop, but anytime there's a flat surface, it is immediately identified as a storage facility and pretty soon you can't even get to it. So out back here, I used to store a whole bunch of my form supplies and concrete accessories, but it's had a fairly radical facelift for a very domestic purpose. So I used to have lumber storage on both sides and I stored a lot of form lumber here, new and used, and my stakes and you can still see a lot of you know concrete chemical buckets and sealer and form release and all sorts of things but I'm getting out of the concrete business. Concrete is a much younger man's game so this has just kind of been, I'm trying to sort of lean out the amount of stuff I'm storing out here. It's, it's pretty classy to point out that this is where my trash cans live now. But hey, I mean, life includes some trash, right? But the real changes are happening over here. You see this little projection right here? The cost-benefit analysis between the costs of having chickens and the benefits of having chickens has suddenly changed because I have five, soon to be six, I hope, grandkids right here in my community and grandkids love chickens. And my daughter-in-laws are enamored of the ideas of chickens and Kelly has long wanted chickens so it's become time to add a few chickens to the mix. This is a little bitty chicken house. This is easy access to the nesting boxes. And the little slackers have not produced anything so far today. So one kind of cool thing about this whole thing, it's all just repurposed lumber. I've a couple of sheets of this four inch T1 I had saved from an earlier remodel. I don't even remember the remodel. In fact, I think all of these sheets came from that. This door was part of a whole house facelift that I did for Judy Vianne. You're going to hear a lot more about that because it was her husband, Bill Vianne, who gave me my blacksmith tools 15 years ago. Been hanging on to it. I'm walking on some concrete 4x8 form panels. This is where the chickens are hanging out right now, but I'm making them an outdoor run. These are banties. I'm not sure how I ended up with banties as the first hands in the fleet, but we've got 15 more full-size layers that are growing up that are going to be big enough to sort of make their living in here. My wife, who's a seamstress, decided that the girls needed just a little privacy when they went in there to do their thing. 
This is a little watering device which is leaking, but these are called chicken drippers or chicken nipples. You see that? That if they just peck those, they get a few drips of water and they're learning to use them. So this is the last, the last sort of phase of the chicken project. I'm going to put a little run out here so the girls can go out and get some sun. And when we get 15 more hens, they're going to have to have some space or they'll be getting rather impatient with each other. So the chickens live behind here. Once the run is built, I'm going to cut a little door in here and a little ramp so they can walk the plank in and out, get a little air. I'm going to have a retractable tarp so in the, in the wintertime the rain doesn't just pour down on them. The fencing is important. I've dug a trench around the perimeter so I'm going to bury the chicken wire so that the dinosaurs that live in Jurassic Park, which is just, just over the edge here in the creek, won't come up and cannibalize my chickens. So I don't know, maybe another week we'll have this ready and the girl can get some sunshine and some green grass. So this is the compressor that I've had for about, I think, 12 years that compresses the air to run my power hammer. The power hammer is an air hog. It takes 90 CFM at 90 PSI. And the only way I could do that on my site here was with diesel. So this is a towable compressor, Atlas Copco. It had, I think, I think it had 1,600 hours on it when I bought it. And it just works great. So the compressor that I just showed you pushes the air into my shop underground. And I think I mentioned in the last shop tour that I've got a storage vessel, a 12 inch diameter, 10 foot long piece of pipe. And I welded caps on the end and it's buried about two feet under the ground. And there was lots of conversation on the channel, lots of comments from people with strong opinions and in some cases informed opinions about the danger or safety of a homemade pressure vessel as it pertained to the health and safety of the people who were occupying the shop. And I've been thinking and contemplating and weighing the cost and benefit and how much risk and is there risk and whether if the vessel fails it'll fail with a pinhole and just bleed air out or with a sudden catastrophic explosion, which will shower gravel and shrapnel all over the shop. When I think about it, I realize that, you know, anything that has pressure, no pressure right now, very, very um, anticlimactic, but anything with, you know, 115 pounds of pressure inside a vessel like that could be a problem. But I had determined just to wait for a while, and as it turns out, Waiting is sometimes a pretty worthwhile strategy because my friend Phil the plumber called me the other day and said, hey, if you'll help me get this pressure vessel out of this laundromat job that he was working on, you can have it. So look at this beautiful tank. I've got 291 gallons of air storage capacity in a Hamilton Engineering pressure vessel. This is certified as a boiler tank and it's in good shape. The inside's relatively clean. I'm going to clean it out some more and I'm going to find a spot, you know, right around here somewhere to use this as the air storage capacity I need to provide the initial gulps of air that my power hammer needs while the compressor is coming up to speed. So I'm trying to decide whether to mount it right behind the power hammer and burn up that shop space maybe move or get rid of that cutting table. Maybe I put it outside the shop over there by the chickens and then pipe the air in. Maybe I mount it on the side of the turret on this crane so it's up off the floor and doesn't take up any shop space. I haven't decided, but I have decided. Thank you, Phil. This is gonna make a really nice addition to the shop. So those of you who have real information on this sort of thing instead of just a carpenter's hip shot, I'd be interested in your observations about utilizing this as the storage vessel to prime the power hammer, maybe plumbing a smaller compressor into this to maintain a head of pressure for general shop air, whether a smaller compressor and the bigger big compressor could work together into this tank, you know, the big compressor when I'm forging, the small compressor just to keep shop air available. So anyhow, I'm, I'm really interested and anxious to hear what you may have to teach me about how to input this into a shop air system that includes a power hammer. So, so this space is clearly not being used effectively. I mean, it's kind of a hallway. 
I've got some steel storage, carbon steel and mild steel scraps. Big old cutting table that just accumulates the sort of ubiquitous um, clutter that my shop seems to breed at night. So I'm, I'm gonna upgrade this. I'm interested in your thoughts because someday I think I would like a bigger power hammer in here. I'd like maybe a, you know, a five or a 600 pound Nazelle or Chambersburg perhaps. Seems like it would be good to put them back to back. Uh, so anyhow, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts. Check this out, I got this from Cy. I bought this, I'm buying. We haven't quite worked out the deal. This from Cy the other day. This is an original and effectively factory conditioned Buffalo Forge cast iron forge and blower. And the blower is still, still works, it's dry in there. I think it went through a fire at one time. But this is dandy, it's all here. This is the original pipe for crying out loud. The original pipe from the blower down to the Toyer, 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 whatever it is, the duck's nest, fire pot, got a clinker breaker. It's just a dandy. So I think I'm gonna to put together a big sort of vat of white vinegar and use that to, and perhaps, yeah, I'm not gonna do the electrolysis thing. I'm just gonna clean this up in vinegar and put it back together so it looks nice and we'll have another coal forge maybe to take to demonstrations and that sort of thing. So a couple things going on here. I replaced two skylights about a year ago trying to get more light in here for filming. I just put Lexan panels over the openings that had the old fiberglass panels in it. The light is better. I think I'm going to do some more of that. I've got two other locations in here with old fiberglass panels that I think I'm going to tear out and put Lexan in and get more natural light into the shop. And the natural light that's shining in here illuminates a truss that I made, I think, 12 years ago for a home show. This was on display at Garrison's Building Supply for a long time. So a couple more items. Obviously, it's chaos in here for reasons we may talk about later. I've got Kelly, some of Kelly's bee equipment. She's got honey supers and more frames and some cordless gear that I've been picking up partially for her, partially for me. Under here I have, I'm storing some of the plenums for our ribbon burners. These are cast, I cast the, I have cast, a friend of mine casts a refractory in the bottom of these plenums to make just a really effective ribbon burner. These ribbon burners when they're done are for sale on our website. And here's where we package them. Kelly takes care of this for us. We use a post office shipping container. We use some sound insulating Furtex. We use some 5 8 OSB. The ribbon burner just drops right in here. We have some instructions and some stickers and it just, it works pretty good. I mean, repurposing some of the leftover roof sheathing. So the last thing, and it really is coming up pretty soon. I mean, it's gotta be, we gotta deal with this pretty soon. Thanks to a lot of the really good information that we've gotten from you guys on the channel is that this, uh, this electrical panel's got to go. What's the brand on this? Federal? Yeah, Federal Pacific Electric. We have been told now by probably 30 of you electricians that these are known as fire starters. I forget the acronym. There's some sort of a pretty catchy nickname for these things. They are rumored and understood to not be an effective breaker system. I know that they are hard to click in. They're sometimes too easy to take out. The breakers are expensive. When I, when I go to add another 20 amp, you know, a 40, you know, combined 220 outlet or circuit, that breaker costs, you know, 80 or 90 bucks they're just because they're so sort of rare now because they're not in demand. So we're gonna replace this pretty soon. Probably sort of expand the electrical capacity of the shop, anticipating maybe getting another power hammer one of these days. So there are some things on the, on the schedule for this old building. It needs a new roof. It has intermittent leaks. The leaks kind of move around. It'll leak here for a winter and then the leak moves over there for a winter and probably pour a little more concrete. And anyhow, we still have a lot of fun out here. Once the spec house is behind us, we'll be spending a lot more time in the shop. And I hope that those of you who are here for the carpentry will stay for the blacksmithing because those of you who have been here for the blacksmithing have sure put up with a lot of carpentry and we thank you for that. And if you're ever in this part of the world, you know, 
ping me on the on the uh, website or something and if the schedules would line up I would be happy to give you a shop tour and in any case thanks for watching and keep up the good work